This is 99 Novels, a podcast by the International Anthony Burgess Foundation. In 1984, the writer Anthony Burgess selected his 99 favourite novels in English since the outbreak of the Second World War. Never short of an opinion about books, Burgess's list is typically idiosyncratic and invites closer attention, so we've invited some of the leading scholars, critics and writers to tell us more about each of the 99 novels. So read along with us as we explore a reading list created by one of the most original literary voices of the 20th century. In this episode, we're heading to an alternate universe as writer, academic and curator Glyn Morgan guides us through Pavan by Keith Roberts. Published in 1968, Pavan is set in a Great Britain ruled by the Catholic Church after the assassination of Elizabeth I. The story picks up in the 20th century and follows a disparate group of characters as they navigate a world on the cusp of rebellion. Burgess lauds the depiction of a modern England that is also medieval and calls the novel a striking work of the imagination. Keith Roberts was born in Kettering in 1935. He wrote 13 novels including The Furies, The Chalk Giants and Molly Zero. He was also an illustrator and worked on the artwork for New Worlds and Impulse magazines. He died in 2000 at the age of 65. Glyn Morgan is a writer, academic and curator based in London. He's the author of Imagining the Unimaginable, Speculative Fiction and the Holocaust and curator of the forthcoming blockbuster immersive exhibition Science Fiction Voyage to the Edge of Imagination, which opens at the Science Museum in London on the 6th of October 2022 and runs until the 4th of May 2023. Glynn has also edited a new volume of essays, interviews and 200 colour illustrations to accompany the exhibition. Check out the description of this episode for all relevant links and a list of all the books mentioned. I'm Graham Foster of the Burgess Foundation, and I spoke to Glyn Morgan in July 2022. Glyn, thanks for joining us on the 99 Novels podcast. Today we're talking about Pavan by Keith Roberts. The first question we like to ask on these podcasts is about your history with with the book. Uh, How did you first discover Pavan and and what did you make of it? Yeah, I I first came across this book uh, 10 or 15 years ago maybe. Um, and I'd, I'd always been interested in alternate history stories and scenarios, that kind of what if um, game that you can play with history. Um, but I, it was only around that time that I had begun actively pursuing them as a, as a serious avenue for, for research. Um, so I was do, going into a bit more effort to kind of go back through the genre and read some of the kind of classics that I had you know, missed or, or, or were unavailable to me and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, and there's no shortage of them to choose from. Um, and I still can't claim to have done more than scratch the surface. Um, but looking at other people's recommendations and, and, you know, as you, as you widen your knowledge of the scholarship, you find, um, that this book by Keith Roberts, um, comes up again and again as, as something of, uh, of the canon, if you can say that alternate history has a canon. That may indicate why Burgess chose it for his list of 99 novels. It's one of, uh, there's, there's a few science fiction books on on Burgess's list, but not that many. And Burgess himself was quite ambivalent about science fiction in, in some of his journalism. So um, what was the novel's reputation in 1984 when the list was being compiled? And what, why do you think Burgess chose it to to include with with sort of novels that you would probably more expect, like James Joyce and that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I can't claim to be a, a Burgess scholar by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm sure you know you and and your listeners will have an, a better idea about why he may have been drawn to it. But I do think it's notable that of all the alternate history narratives he could have picked on, he picked this one. And in writing about it, he highlights um, another, which is Kingsley Amos's The Alteration, 
from 1976 as another as one of the books that he couldn't quite fit into the 99. Um, and what do these two have in common? Well, they're both alternate histories of Catholicism. Um, and so I think that makes a particular impression on him. Um, as I said, it's, it is as well one of those definitive um, alternate history novels, um, particularly from the period. Um, and I think that it was still wearing that title well, especially for as a British novel um, into the 80s. Um, it's interesting, though, because I think that since then, its status has diminished um, in more recent decades, both as Roberts's own star has faded over time, but also as alternate history has experienced a greater boom in popularity and drawn in more writers, both from um, outside of science fiction, you know, from liter the literary mainstream but also from within uh, the boundaries of, of wider science fiction genre as well. One reason, another reason I think it may have appealed to him is that the science fiction that he could be quite disparaging about in the, in the kind of journalism that I've read, he's often not drawn to stuff that feels too ungrounded. Um, he makes, you know, makes some very snooty comments about, um, about Asimov and, and things like that, stuff that's too out there. And the stuff he does like, the the ballads and things like that, it, it has that greater connection to contemporary Britain and to a, a sense of like the real world in a much more kind of uh a much more kind of direct way. And I think that that may be what appeals to him because although this is a book about an alternate history um, triggered by um, the assassination of of a Elizabeth I, it is actually um, a book that I think probably still had some resonances um, to him in the eighties. Um, thinking about you know the changes that were going on um, in the UK in particular, and that kind of sense of of an era coming to an end, or or maybe already being over, and not knowing um what era awaited us in the future yeah I, I think i think the way you describe uh burgess's relationship with science fiction is exactly right and and one of the books on on the list obviously is 1984 by george orwell and and that has all the hallmarks that you describe it's it's a novel uh of a sort of speculative novel but very much grounded in in the the sort of britain of the 1940s um, and and if you look at Burgess's own fiction, not that he would describe it science fiction, but something like A Clockwork Orange is certainly yeah, exactly. certainly grounded in in what he was seeing on the on the streets of of Britain at the time. So with with that in mind, uh, how does Pavan fit into the genre of alternate fit, alternate history in general? Is it what you would expect from an alternate history novel that is perhaps more famous it is and it isn't um so it's got a lot of the hallmarks of the genre um it has a very clear um divergence point um so which is the the name that we give to the kind of that moment in history where the change happened so in this case an assassin's bullet um killing elizabeth the first um ahead of the Spanish Armada. Um, and so that's, you know, really important to, to alternate history. And, and generally, the most successful narratives have a very clear single point, although not always. Um, it's typical of its time, in some ways, that it is a, um, a fix-up novel. Um, so it is um, made of short stories. Um, which were all individually published and then reworked into um, into this this novel, and that is very common in science fiction in the fifties, sixties, and seventies. And you still see it now, but it is more of a novelty when it's done these days. Um, and alternate history, in particular, um, tends to steer more towards a kind of conventional beginning, middle, and end um novel format these days um again with notable exceptions so so it is it is both typical and not typical non-typical one thing that i know burgess um does say is that he he talks about this book as being 
um, the first full length exercise in the fiction of hypothesis with reference to it being in the first or, or a very early alternate history. And I'd say that he's pretty out there. First, I mean, it, as with any genre, um, there are debates about when alternate history begins and, and where you can trace those roots. And, and if you wanted to play the long game, you can go at least as far back as the Romans. Um, but the first alternate history novel was certainly a French book um, by Louis Geoffroy, um, The History of the Universal Monarchy, Napoleon and the Conquest of the World, published in 1836. But even in English, there are some um, real classics of the genre, uh, like El Sprague de Camp's Less Darkness Fall, which was published in 1939, um, the excellent Bring the Jubilee um, by Ward Moore, which is 1953. Um, and those books involve time travel, which make them a slightly different flavor of alternate history book. But then even that kind of uh, what what Karen Hallickson, an alternate history scholar, calls the true alternate history, um, even within the true alternate histories where there is no time travel, there's no alternate dimensions or parallel worlds, um, you've got Philip K. Dick's um, The Man in the High Castle in 1962, which is perhaps one of the most famous alternate history novels um, of all time. Um, and certainly a landmark of, in his career as well. So it's not to say that this, it, you know, Burgess is wrong and this is not an important book. It comes at a really important time for the genre and um, both science fiction as a whole, but also alternate history are going through, you know, a series of revisions and expansions. They're becoming more populist and broad in their appeal, but also more intellectually challenging and critically rich. Um, and I think that this book it really kind of springs out of that moment and and has a really lovely balance of of uh, complex themes rich characters um good storytelling but also that kind of uh, vivid um speculative imagination that we expect from the genre thank you that was a, a very full answer um <laughs> One one thing that, that is very apparent from Burgess's list and his his own writing generally is that that he he sort of relates science fiction to dystopian fiction. Yeah. Most of the novels that he's chosen on his list that can be categorized as science fiction can also be categorized as dystopian fiction. Um, is that true of Pavan? And are there any ways in which it uh, defies that categorization? Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, what do we mean by dystopia? Um, certainly, this is someone's dystopia, a lot of people's dystopia, perhaps. I mean, it's a, a Catholic hegemony, um, untampered by other influences. So this is not going to be a great society to be gay in, to be a woman. It doesn't seem to be a particularly great place to be poor in either. Um, but then those societal issues are not really addressed in the book either. I'm sort of reading those problems into it as a modern reader. Um, so would Burgess have seen this as being a dystopia? I, I couldn't really say, but certainly if you're looking at it through that lens, then yeah, absolutely, it's a dystopia. But if you're being more generous, then, you know, there's no threat of climate change in this novel. Um, it's set in the in the 60s and that's not a problem there's no nuclear war um threatened um there's less war generally but progress is slow um but then there is some progress so and at the same time um the world of the novel the people in the novel are more in touch with their landscape and with the natural world um and there's still wild magic and and dangerous myth there in a in a very like anti-modern way and i think it's too complex to just write that off as le and label the whole thing as a dystopia so i would maybe resist having to put it into that box um i'd say it has dystopian elements but i would resist putting it into the box and calling it a dystopia but i certainly however would not call it a utopia either yeah the the, the needle sort of swings back and forth i mean there's the mm. seats with with the Inquisition, the sort uh, yeah. of bl blood-soaked scenes of people being tortured and and that sort of thing, and then the needle swings back, and there's sort of uh, bucolic descriptions of these big sort of semaphore structures that are used yeah. 
instead of telephones that that sort of transmit messages by flags across the the landscape and it, it's it's sort of very british very english traditional english landscapes and and that sort of thing so it, it's it's and and there's no world war 2 in it either you know there's no none of those big sort of destabilizing events have happened because the catholic church rules over all of europe so it's there's a sort of enforced peace even in this repressive society so you're right in in that it it it's, it doesn't sort of fulfill everything about a dystopia that that you would perhaps expect one of the things that in the novel that that really struck me is is uh how far back the actual alternate universe is in in the mix the characters sort of take over the the sort of personal yeah. conversations between the characters and sometimes you almost forget that this is not the real world that this is not this is this is a world that is that is built out of uh speculative elements because the human characters in it are so to the fore so how how do you think roberts deals with his characters within that world and and do you think the novel is more preoccupied with the human beings over the grand sort of historical descriptions that yeah. you would find perhaps in another another style of alternate history yeah definitely no i, I think that's definitely right that he's very much more focused on the characters and and the humanism um in this moment than he is in those kind of big sweeping um alter like stories that you do sometimes and you know a, there's a large portion of the alternate history genre which is um effectively kind of fantasy war games you know it's um it's lots of like uh kit descriptions of kit and battle maneuvers and um historical detail you know very carefully and documented and and detailed and this is not that sort of book at all um it's a novel which takes place over several generations um so we don't see the char- same characters all the way through the book um you know each story is focused on a different a different place and a different time and a different set of people um and yet somehow despite even with that you're it's very much focused on those characters rather than on that broader sweeping narrative that might be occurring in the background. Um, the format lends itself to that, of course. You you know these short stories are vignettes focused on individual characters, and you get their lives flash briefly um, against that kind of static tableau of of this society that's not changing um, or or is changing so slowly as to be almost imperceptible. Um, but I think it's also where the book's power comes from. So we're with these characters for a relatively short amount of time, but you feel for their, you know, their loves that are lost and their friendships and their motivations in a much more powerful way than you would if you were reading a book about a completely fictitious king or pope or someone um, and seeing that kind of top-down grand story of sweeping narratives. Um, that's there in the background because the book does have battles and armies and economic shifts and balances and that kind of thing. But it's all the backdrop and the characters are very much kept in the focus. Um, and I think that's part of its appeal and success as a book. Uh, yeah, and these characters, their their concerns aren't, a lot of the time, aren't with the sort of that higher political, the, the church element of of their their world they're they're concerned with like the first story for example is concerned with uh basically a a truck driver he drives sort of this steam steam train that goes on the roads across the country and it's about him being concerned with with meeting the barmaid at a local pub who he who he fancies essentially and wants to make a life with but you know it's all about his sort of neuroses about about that relationship really um and and that that that's something that that i found very unexpected when i when i picked it up thinking it's an alternate history about the catholic church taking over over great britain there's hardly any of that in the book really. yeah, yeah yeah exactly but it's also because the the church is such a monolithic structure in this book so you know the the characters 
can't you know it's all by the time the novel when the novel is set it's already been hundreds of years since it's achieved that stability and and dominance so you know the characters can't imagine a world outside that world because it's so all consuming and all dominating i mean in some ways i guess it kind of comes it could be you could draw analogies to um you know the famous quote that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism because we are so enmeshed in that system um, that it's really hard to step outside it and get that view. Um, and I think that that's the same for the characters in this book. So they don't, they're not constantly thinking, oh, isn't society bad? I wish it was different because they don't know that it can be any other way. While we say that the church in the novel is this sort of all dominating monolithic structure that that is sort of impossible to see the boundaries of there is a passage near the end of the the novel where a character um it, it's sort of it's set uh after the fall of of the the world that we've just read a whole novel about essentially and a character reveals knowledge of, of real world events such as belson and buchenwald and we're already sort of told in the book that the the second world war hasn't happened what do you think this means? What's what's Roberts trying to say in, in this part specifically, and and in in a wider way? What what does Pavan have to say about the the real world in in other ways? Yeah, it's a really interesting passage and and section that bit um, in the kind of epilogue of the book, um, and I returned to it when I was doing um, the research for my own own book on the Holocaust in speculative fiction. Um, I think. For one thing, it's important to remember the context in which the book's written. So it was written in the 1960s, which is the moment when the Holocaust is kind of re-entering public consciousness um, in the English-speaking world, at least. And so in that ref- in that kind of um, context, it's perhaps not that surprising a reference. But uh, as you say, it also kind of seems to dismantle the rest of the book because it shows a history um, which shouldn't exist in this kind of faux Elizabethan setting. I think it actually offers an opportunity to completely reposition the book, not as an alternate history, but as a book set in the far future. So it's actually perhaps a post-apocalyptic book because um, there are references in there to Armageddon and Infernos. And again, context, you have to remember that the 60s, it's Cold War period, um, and it makes me think that maybe this novel has happened, is set actually at, after a, you know, destructive nuclear war and society has somehow rebuilt itself and kind of gone round again. And so all of these names and places um, are maybe not the same names and places that we are familiar with, if that makes sense. Um and I, when I start thinking that way, I start thinking about it then in comparison to something like um, Canticles for Leibowitz, another Catholic dystopia by Walter M. Miller Jr. Um, from 1959, which uh, has monks living in a post-nuclear apocalypse society, um, preserving knowledge by copying blueprints and things. Um, and, you know, th- maybe that's a bit of a stretch to kind of reposition the entire book in that way, but it's kind of an interesting exercise as well. Um, and I think Roberts is sort of leaving that open a little bit. Um, at the same time, it could be a moment in which Roberts is um, kind of writing to the reader in a in a much more kind of direct way, um, which again is not uncommon in alternate history stories. So um, Philip K. Dick's Man in the High Castle comes to mind again because it has a scene in it where one of the characters has this kind of epiphany or vision or maybe literally is transported to another world and finds themselves in this like nightmarish California where um, all the Americans are loud and brash and confident Um, and it's you know it's it's supposed to be our world that this character has briefly been transported into and Dick uses that to like be able to kind of more directly draw some comparisons and put that idea into people's minds. So that kind of permeability between real history and fictional history and alternate history has been in the mix in the genre for a long time. And I think that there's maybe an element of that 
in there as well that that Roberts is playing up to. Okay, and and away from the novel commenting on on the real world, do you think the book is in conversation with other literature, perhaps other literature outside of the alternate history genre? Um, it's rare that a book is completely isolated. Do you do you think that's the case with Pavan? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, as I've, I've already mentioned, Canticles for Leibowitz, um, and there's a whole branch of science fiction that's interested in Catholicism and the structures of the Catholic Church. And I think you could easily slot Pavan into a perfect dialogue with that. And, you know, uh, Mary Doria Russell's The Sparrow, uh, for example, or the, or the role St. Eustace plays in um, uh, Russell Hoban's Ridley Walker. Um I'm the wrong person to go on about that for too long. It's not an area that I can point to specifically, but I can recommend uh, Jim Clark's excellent book on the topic, um, which is uh, Science Fiction and Catholicism, The Rise and Fall of the Robot Papacy, which is an excellent subtitle. Um, and Jim is a, a friend of the Burgess Foundation, of course. Yes, I know, yeah. Um, so yeah, already familiar with his stuff. Mm. But I think also more broadly, I think the novel is worth including in conversations about the new wave as well um it it stands out from stuff by jg ballard and harlan ellison and norman spinrad etc but it also has a lot that it can productively say to them about about the kind of time in which it's written and and the kind of pushing of the boundaries of science fiction against that kind of more literary um, technique and 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 sense of style and character um so it's not as edgy as some of those other writers but i think it would it'd be interesting to put alongside it i also think it's an interesting example of regional fiction um which is not something you often see in science fiction unless uh, with the exception of stuff that's set in you know one city or something um because the 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 dorset setting of the book is really important to it um and it's very much rooted in its geography and its place, um, both for plot purposes, but also in kind of the spirit of the book, you know, in some, something deep in the fabric of the characters and, and the, the kind of um, landscape of the novel is both the landscape of the land. And I think that there's a productive dialogue that you could have there with um, modern stuff that, you know, that there's... A, the new gothic movement especially new british gothic stuff which is very interested in landscape and place like andrew michael hurley's the Loney, um which is set in morecambe bay or or the works of alan garner where the landscape is so important um to those books as is like local mythology and stuff but even you know pushing out of out of the genre into kind of uh, the literary canon um you know, it's it's hardy country as well, isn't it? So you could have quite an interesting discussion about Pavan and Thomas Hardy as well, I think. Well, someone could. I've never been a Hardy fan, but someone could have that discussion. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's right. And, uh, you know, you mentioned a few authors that, well, you've mentioned Andrew Michael Hurley, another friend of the foundation, um, who who is writing this sort of neo-Gothic Mm. Or should that be neo neo gothic? Because I think yes. people like Iris <laughs> Murdoch were writing neo gothic. Yeah. But um, do you think Pavan has a legacy today? Um, it's a, a question we, we normally ask: What is the legacy? But Pavan yeah. is such a sort of uh, occupies such a strange sort of place that that you have to ask: Does it have a legacy? And and do you see its direct influence on any writers working today? Yeah, it's a tough one. I'd like to think so, because I think it is a book that deserves to have a legacy. Um, but in all honesty, I, I think it may have been overshadowed now. Um, I, I think, and I haven't checked this, perhaps I should have, I think it's the only one of Roberts's book books in regular publication, um, at least in the UK, um, as part of the Galantz Science Fiction Masterworks series. But even if I'm mistaken there, um, it's still not a book that you see people talking about generally anymore, um, either in scholarly circles or, um, you know, in kind of um, book clubs and book blogs and, and things like that. Um, it's interesting. I think it, in terms of the influence on other writers, I think it may be becoming a writer's book, you know, the kind of 
those books that live on um, in that niche that they're admired by people who write, but maybe have lost their kind of broader readership. Because I know that it's also a favorite of William Gibson, um, the author of Neuromancer, um, who talks about it and um, uh, The Chalk Giants, another one of Roberts's books, as being amongst his favorite post-apocalyptic books. So um, again, he kind of latches on to the ending um, in that categorization. But I think it has generally been overshadowed by the weight of alternate history novels which have come out after it. Um, and in particular, the tendency of those books to center on more recent historical divergence points as well. So, you know, we are drowning in alternate histories of the Second World War and the American Civil War, um, for example. Um, and I love a lot of those books and I, I have written on and and published on a lot of those books. So. Um, I've got nothing against those settings, but there are a lot of those books. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, these kind of odder, quirkier novels um, like Roberts's find it harder to kind of find their niche amongst that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think maybe it's it's becoming more of a connoisseur's book, perhaps, um, rather than um, something that's firmly established in the canon for the for the wider readership. Okay, and and perhaps a, a sort of follow up question to that is is that um from when Pavan was written in 1968, you mentioned that that we're sort of drowning in alternate histories these days. Um, but how has the genre developed itself? What what has changed within the within the writing of these alternate histories? since 1968? Um, well, I think for one thing, our relationship with history has changed. I think that people have become more aware of the constructedness of historical narrative. Um, and so that is both a liberating thing, because it means that we can redraw those historical narratives to better reflect um, the values of our time, or to kind of excavate stories that we had previously thought were lost. But it's also scary, right? Because people are suddenly plunged in a position where everything they thought that they knew um, is no longer valid and or no longer true. And people generally don't deal well with being told that they're wrong, um, especially about things that they internalized um, since like primary school and thought were accurate. Um, and I think that in particular 21st century alternate history has has really kind of had to grapple with that and has done so in really interesting ways. So um, I mentioned before about divergent points um, and having very clean ones. And the easiest way to have a clean divergence point is to have it center on one person. So in Pavan, it's the assassination of Elizabeth I. So it's that kind of... Um, model of history that centers on the biographies of great men, as Thomas Carlyle put it. But the problem is that that naturally limits the kind of stories that you can tell and, and who will be involved in them and also kind of maybe isn't how history actually works anyway. So alternate history has kind of been stuck between that format, which works really well, narratively speaking, and a desire to maybe uh, have a more kind of um, systems-based approach to history where, you know, some you make a change in the timeline and actually it's much more complicated how it would ripple out and more chaotic. Um, and I think that there have been some books that are starting to really kind of explore that and have, have fun and, and actually say something quite powerful about our relationship with history off the back of that. Okay. Um, that's a, a, a really interesting place to to sort of leave alternate history um uh, we we like to 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 finish up uh our podcast by asking the same question to all of our our guests uh and that question if you could add a hundredth book to burgess's list to round the list up to to a hundred what would it be and why such a hard question is the hardest of all the questions <laughs> that you've asked me i mean if we did 20 takes of you asking me this question i'd probably give you a different answer each time um but this time 
um, in this branch of our alternate history. <laughs> um, I think I'd say uh, Levitid Haas and Man Lies Dreaming. Um, so despite me having kind of uh, perhaps besmirched Second World War alternate histories, this is one. <laughs> Um, but I think that it is a really imaginative, really powerful and visceral novel, um, which I think Burgess would have really appreciated as well. Like it, it is dark, but it's also funny. I think it sits quite nicely alongside um, Clockwork Orange and 1984. Um, it's set in a world where um, the Nazis uh, failed in their attempts to come to power. In Germany and the prominent members of the Nazi party including Adolf Hitler flee to Britain um, as the Communist Party come to power in, in Germany instead and it's set decades later um, and they've all kind of dispersed and they're just just doing jobs now and Adolf Hitler has set himself up as a private detective um, and uh, it's very challenging but very very interesting and entertaining as well um private detectives in that kind of hard-boiled genre get beaten up a lot and some terrible stuff happens to them and you don't mind when it happens to this detective <laughs> so it adds a it adds a different kind of um playfulness to that genre um but it also has something really meaningful to say about you know our changing relationship with fascism and right-wing politics and um, isolationism in this country. Um, and I think that it's, you know, it's really timely in that respect as well. Well, that sounds like a, an amazing recommendation. I think uh, that's another one to add to the the, the, the bedside table. Um, Glyn, thanks for joining us on the 99 Novels podcast. That's been a really fascinating look at a novel that, that not many people have have heard of, let alone read, and I think it's it's one of the the more interesting novels on on Burgess's list. So thank you for for shedding some light on it for us. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, thank you for having me on. You've been listening to Ninety Nine Novels, a podcast by the International Anthony Burgess Foundation. Glyn Morgan's book, Imagining the Unimaginable, Speculative Fiction and the Holocaust, is published by Bloomsbury and available now from your favourite place to buy books. The Science Museum's exhibition, Science Fiction, Voyage to the Edge of Imagination, runs from the 6th of October 2022 to the 4th of May 2023. The accompanying book, edited by Glyn Morgan, is published by Thames and Hudson and available now. The theme music is Anthony Burgess's Concerto for Flute, Strings and Piano in D minor and is performed by No Dice Collective. They can be found online at nodicecollective.com. For more information about Anthony Burgess and to find out how you can support the work of the Burgess Foundation, visit www.anthonyburgess.org. If you've enjoyed this episode, why not leave us a review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts?